And I call the Honourable Member for Bowman. Thank you very, very much, Deputy Speaker. This, uh, this afternoon is an opportunity to talk about the TRIPS agreement, which uh, over the last decade has slowly come to fruition after a recognition late in the last century that the uh, market failure that exists in developing economies made it almost impossible for us to have a realistic crack at the great killers, uh, TB uh, and malaria and AIDS, HIV in particular. So what we have seen in the last 10 years is significant advances since the work first began and much of it emanated of course from Harvard University where Geoffrey Sachs and also Michael Kramer, an economist from, uh, from Harvard School of Economics, brought this issue uh, to public recognition. And so it's worth noting in this debate today where we finally uh, connect the TRIPS agreement after at least uh, six or seven years of uh, waiting since it was drafted to recognise that work that occurred ten years ago. Uh, it was Kremer who published uh, Pharmaceuticals and the Developing World, which was a really important contribution in 2002. And some of the initial drafts of that document back in uh, 1999 came to my attention as a young student looking for an area of important international health uh, to work on. At that time, it was really important to re recognise that the market failure that really prevented uh, major uh, pharmaceutical corporations from taking cutting-edge drugs to the developing world was a problem for which we had no solution, and it wasn't that long ago. At the time, the concept was to turn to wealthy countries and ask them for a contribution proportional to their GDP. Uh, to a fund which would act as a pull mechanism so that as great drugs potentially came along for which uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers knew there was no large financial market because the disease primarily existed in the developing world, then a fund would effectively pull it through the uh, stages to eventually see that drug being approved. So I guess we had two types of diseases to consider. First of all, we had uh, conditions like HIV that were a significant problem and offered a financial uh, uh, revenue in developed economies and therefore could be taken to the developing world. Uh, but secondly, we had the diseases that existed almost exclusively in the developing world. These are the ones that have huge amounts of morbidity. Uh, these are the diseases unknown to us in wealthy countries, but uh, of course they afflict millions in the developing world. And I mean, a list of those include Chagas disease, dengue, uh, hookworm, Japanese encephalitis, lymphatic filariasis, uh, onchocerciasis, schistosomiasis, um, trachoma, with the exception that exists in Australia. For those diseases, we know there's millions of people affected, but not really any revenue model to get the research happening because pharmaceutical manufacturers know there's not really a great market there. There's no market there for three reasons. First of all, these are relatively small economies, large populations, very, very low GDP per capita. No real market to purchase these pharmaceuticals, no way of distributing it. And of course, the positive externalities of people seeking out treatments and pre pre preventing infectious disease from spreading simply don't exist because people have given up seeking medical treatments in many cases. Uh, that challenge, of course, was far uh, less complex with the area of HIV because since at least 1984, when it was first known as HTLV, there's been a worldwide effort to find cures for, um, for HIV. And we're now in a position where, while we can't eradicate the virus, although we think we've come very close on occasion, we're at the point now where we know that people will most commonly live and die with the disease rather than from it. So there are remarkable breakthrough drugs, and just getting them uh, to the developing world was a simpler process, and that's where TRIPS came in. So we acknowledged that drugs were being created, but we didn't want to undermine the first world market by producing large amounts of this, this drug, delivering them to the third world. First of all, that undermines any market there might be in those countries. But secondly, you've got the risk that these drugs are purloined, taken cross-border, or actually sold in poor countries to the wealthy populations that live there. And all of this would undermine the market proposition for these companies to consider doing it. So as a result, TRIPS was, I think, ingenious and really changed the way we were thinking. So back in 1999, uh, you know, Kremer's initial thoughts were about creating this fund that would make pharmaceutical companies say, well, we've got this molecule, it's gonna cost hundreds of thousands or millions to develop, but at least we know there's a pot of money at the end. Well, that pot of money at the end of the rainbow just proved to be a little bit too tricky. In the end, we've fallen back to the more realistic uh, goal of using the market to develop world-leading drugs and then go to the manufacturer and say, you've got a great drug that can work in the developing world, we will pay you to license patent, um, uh, generic manufacture of your drug at super low prices and the wealthy countries will compensate you for your out-of-pocket, for your losses by 
selling that drug to the developing world to people who could never afford it. That proved to be, I guess you'd say, um, you know, a more practical approach to the problem. I mean, globally what we know is that in this um, effort to take technology the poorest parts of the world, we've got a different experience here in developed nations than we have right now in developing economies. Um, traditionally, the old way of doing it was to wait for income to increase, and as income increased, uh, health also improved. That's that correlation between more income uh, and being able to purchase better health. And that's what we saw in, in uh, developed economies, and this was, was really interesting work done by Rob Fogel, who found that 50 per cent of the health improvement and the fall in death rates in the UK, 70 per cent of that improvement in the US actually happened before 1911, which means that was all pre-drugs and pre-technology effectively, certainly pre-antibiotics. So that was the, the developed experience. But in the developing world, you know, it's really completely different. Uh, what we saw in Vietnam, I mean, just recently, you have a nation with uh, you know, a GDP per capita about a tenth of where the US was at the start of last century, but their life expectancy is already 20 years later, longer. Something different is happening in the developed world now. And even in Africa, what we saw with uh, a lot of the instability, GDP falling between 1972 and 1992 by over 10%. But even in that time of falling GDP, we were seeing falls in infant mortality, uh, you know, improvements in, uh, in longevity, which obviously was independent to either GDP or, or household earnings. So this is the new challenge then. We can't afford to wait for the developing world to turn around. We can't afford to wait for incomes to rise. We can't take that uh, standing back approach to build capacity and wealth and hope that health will rise with it. We now have technology, a frontier that can move in even to the most poor and dysfunctional communities and improve health. And I guess that is the path that we've now taken. Samuel Preston um, estimated even in the 70s that income growth was probably only accounting for between 10 and 25 per cent of the improvement in health. Uh, Dean Jamison, as recently as 2001, was even more precise. He attributed, I think, over 70 per cent of the decline in infant mortality rates uh, between 62 and 87 to technology alone, uh, 21 per cent to better education, and really only about 5 per cent of that improvement due to growth in income. So the general belief now is that we cannot wait for improvements in capacity. We have to give ownership of these solutions to countries themselves because they know what works. But in the end, there's very elaborate partnerships supported by TRIPS, which include your bilateral and your multilateral uh, agreements. You've got uh, the faith organisations, NGOs, the private sector brought in, and then, of course, uh, agreements with government. It's a very complex uh, partnership that under, under, underpins it. And this, of course, is at the heart of the Global Fund. And the Global Fund is there to uh, specifically focus on those three big killers. Um, AIDS, tuberculosis uh, and malaria. And look, they've just taken a very simple approach. Large pot of money, listening to the, to the countries of origin uh, and where the work is being done, giving them full control over it, but having a process that doesn't advance unless every one of those parties that I've just listed are involved. And getting government, civil society uh, working together is not new. We have NGOs all over the world, uh, often poorly coordinated, but doing their best in sort of resource uh, sparse environments. But, what has changed in the last 10 years is a genuine reaching out to the private sector, realising that you just have to have the engine room of intellectual property, the engine room of, of new uh, intellectual property, making a difference in the developing world where, it, where there was a time as recently as 2000 where we really hadn't woken up to that. So that's been a very, very significant shift. Uh, along with uh, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who also have made an extraordinary mark just in the last 20 years. I can remember when the foundation First, probably first visited the World Bank was in 2000. And even at that time, you know, the World Bank was more focused on reducing uh, corruption in its dealings with developing economies uh, than it was with uh, elaborate private sector partnerships. So to have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation come along with an utterly different approach, I can remember the impact that it had in, in Washington. And basically the foundation turned up and said, what are the diseases uh, for which there is a cure, but it is not available in those countries? And there was a big long list of, of those. And it was a very simple piece of arithmetic. Uh, the foundation simply said, well, how many people are affected? How much does the drug cost? And how much does it cost to deliver? They multiplied them together and wrote a cheque. I mean, this was an extraordinary change in the way uh, that aid was delivered. Because the foundation simply said, our goal is not to have as many diseases with as many people afflicted at the end of our work. What we want to do is start eradicating disease full stop. And I think when you take this new look at how aid is delivered, which is not how much have I got to give you. But let's pause for a moment and work out how much it costs to get to the goal, agree on the goal, and then you work backwards. 
You work backwards from that and say, is this a realistic one that we can achieve within a lifetime, within a decade, or within in a year? And this, uh, I think looking from the other, other side to say, we don't stop till it's done and achieved, and it will be utterly futile unless we take that approach, which looks at um, the, the destination rather than simply the, you know, the positive feelings of being part of a journey. Uh, the TRIPS agreement, of course, took a long time uh, to connect up here, and it's, I have to note, you know, six years of Labor government where this process could have been accelerated, and I suspect that it wasn't. Uh, these things are way too urgent to wait for something that was drafted and generally agreed in 2007, but here we are finally doing it today uh, in 2014. And I know that's a, a source of concern, but it is an opposition that oh, feels nah. very, very comfortable to oh, take nah. the high moral ground in foreign aid, but often, with all of their domestic disputes and troubles, found it almost impossible to take really meaningful steps ahead. And there were 100 countries afflicted by diseases for which cures were not available that had to wait for the duration of that six years of Labor government to have a coalition government to finally get this moving. I mean, there is probably, and I didn't want to become too partisan in these comments, but there is a sense, there certainly is a the sense that Labor Bowman is easily distracted. Uh, by, um, by other matters and often forget that there's more simple, red tape free ways of getting things done. Uh, again, agreements between New Zealand and Australia are way more complex than often we thought when we embarked, but the, this effort to get a combined Australia-New Zealand therapeutic goods administration is well worth, uh, well worth doing, uh, even though we've probably at the time underestimated its complexity. But with, within IP, having a single trans-Tasman agreement is certainly an excellent idea. Look, to finish with, and my focus was primarily on TRIPS because I think that's the headline story from this legislation, we now have a way of directly incentivising the generic production of breakthrough drugs for the developing world. I wanted really to point out in my speech today that 10 years ago or 15 years ago that was not even contemplated. We're heading in the other direction. But now in economies like uh, sub-Saharan Africa where 38 countries spend less on health in total than the single state of Connecticut and the US. Uh, we can start to make a difference for populations there, even where their own governments don't share the same passion for uh, diverting and maintaining investment in health. There's not a high enough uh, you know, recognition that health underpins economic outcomes in those countries. And until we have the capability and we have the, uh, uh, the sophistication within those governments to have that focus on, on health and human development, then in the meantime we'll have these, I think, uh, very, very fertile partnerships between the world's biggest pharmaceutical manufacturers, the world's biggest technological developers, those who are coming up with the bright ideas that are the subject of IP, particularly here in Australia, civil society and government. And I look forward to those partnerships developing further.